So yeah. Um. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Thanks that for. Looks uh, super good. Uh, thanks for sticking around through that. <laughs> if you like uh, tutorials on how to uh, uh, autofocus and zoom while you can't see yourself on a camera because it's attached to a, a computer through an HDMI, then hit that like button right now. Pretty much. Smash it up. Uh, yeah, I think the white balance is a little off too, so our apologies. We'll rock it from now on out though. Um, so anyway, yeah, it looks like we got uh, 50 people tuned in, so let's go ahead and get started with some genus news this week. Boktoberfest. So we did an Imperial, uh, an Imperial Martin style beer. Basically, we did a Martin style that was supposed to shoot on the upper end of a Martin style's uh, ABV range, which is 6.3, and we way overshot our efficiency for reasons. I don't know. Tim's just too good at what he does, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, trying to do a sort of Mertzen, um Oktoberfest style beer, and uh, ended up sort of making more of a doppelbocky type thing. Yeah, but with that um, same crisp refreshness of a classic Martzen. And so what we have is we're calling it a Boktoberfest. Yeah, so, you know, we got that, and it is actually on tap now. Um, it's a bit of a Keller beer at the moment, but uh, uh, it will be uh, taste. It's already tasting good, and will probably get better as, as it, uh, brightens. it ages and brightens up. So Yeah. Um, uh, kitchen, we're ready to serve food. I cut my thumb yesterday doing some prep. Uh, but it is, it's ready to go, and so we're going to be kind of slow rolling into actually serving food here. Uh, we'll let you know how it goes. It's a new foray into this part of the business, but it's something we've been meaning to do for a while. So we're excited to have that up and running. Yeah, good thing somebody's got like awesome, uh, awesome steps on how to prep everything too. I did. Hey, I wrote out steps. You know what? That's, <laughs> I wrote out steps. Ingredient list, aka. It's a simple uh, build. It's, you build it from the bottom to the top. Uh, anyway, <laughs> no, it, but, does say, uh, it does say which one to turn in the bowl and which ones to mix them and then what to, what to top with. It does. It does say it that. didn't say to turn them. It just said list and then it said end top with anyway. Um, but yeah, so we're I actually really disagree. excited for that. Uh, we're going to be testing it's out hard. some of that this week and um, probably golly, maybe a week out, maybe two weeks, probably at the most. Um, we'll uh, we'll be serving food here. So that's kind of an exciting new uh, step for us um yeah. so also uh we've got those uh shirts that we mentioned last week up on our website quike nation uh, quike nation um yes so for those of you that uh, want to make fun of uh politics just like us um we did uh, design a little shirt that says i like quike um in the sort of i like ike scheme so those are now up and available um speaking of which if you guys do actually want to kind of support our channel support these live streams please, please take a look at our website. We have a bunch of awesome swag up there, um, as well as a few recipe kits that we would love to keep adding to. Um, so if you want to support us, check that out. Um, consider buying something, and we would really appreciate it. Yeah, or you can always super chat us on this with the, for our Will It Beer Fund. Uh, we have had a couple people do that, and we always super appreciate it. Sounds good. Um, yeah, and speaking of Quike, uh, we also got a um, Mangrove Jack Quike strain in, um, which I... Crap, I forgot to look that up, actually, to figure out which strain that is. Uh, I believe it's Voss. Um, so it's, it's a, the second dry quike that we've gotten in so far. So, so far, Lalaman has put out a, a Voss quike. And I believe this is also uh, Voss, but this is Mangrove Jack's quike as well. Um, so two dry quikes. That's, you know, I guess, I mean, originally, I guess they came dry, but... Uh, th yeah. But that was on, on wood. Yeah, <laughs> right. No. No, this is actually really cool. Um, I feel like literally every yeast manufacturer now is jumping on that wagon. Um, so for those of you out there that, you know, have, have heard of the big, the big, huge quike boom, um, then, uh, then yeah, we got it available in pretty much every shape and form at this point in time. Here so. comes quike boom. Yeah. Ready you not. No, yep. Okay. Yep. No, no let's not do that. That was a really good song <laughs> that I made up. Uh, and, uh, oh, apparently I almost know how to spell quike. That was, that was spell check by the way. Spell check did not try to do it. Spell check. <laughs> It yells at me whenever I try to do any brewing term. It's not my fault. Remember, um, e, before I, e before I, because quake. <laughs> um, yeah, so that sums up our Genius Brewing News. I think that takes us on to our Beer of the Week. Beer of the Week. Which, to no surprise, uh, tis the season for a Mertzen, which is our Beer Judging Certification Category 6A. Um, and, uh, yeah, so let's... Let's give you guys a quick breakdown. Um, I'm just going to start with the numbers this week, actually. We'll switch it up a little bit. Um, so Meritzen falls into um, the Category 6, which is a um, amber uh, German, well, amber lager, right? I think it's just amber lager, actually. German amber lager, yeah. German amber, amber lager. Known as a Martin because it, I guess it means March beer, so of course we drink it every October. Yes, 
traditionally brewed in March, which come October, all the home brewers come out and are like, I'm going to brew a Martzen oh, yeah. as I punch the mic. And uh, then we laugh mm. at him because it's like, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> that doesn't quite work that way. That's Frazzle um, Ping was like, he brewed his Martin last week. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, actually, you can. Um, we have the technology nowadays. You can do a three week turnover on these. It's it's not not that hard. Um, but uh, yeah. So as for number wise, um, these things are not hot forward. Um, bitterness, 18 to 24 IBUs. Um, pretty subdued and Definitely falls on that low end. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, you're never, you're not really looking for any hop character at all. So pretty yeah. much a bittering addition, call it a day. Any and hop character that you get, will be just like a subtle lemony grassiness, but it should be very, very subdued. These are meant to be uh, dry and crisp, but also malt forward beers. Yes. Um, and, uh, that brings us to, uh, the, uh, the, um, starting gravities, which are going to be, um, 1054 to 1060. Uh-huh. Um, 1054 to 1060 um, with final gravities of 1010 to 1014, um, which might seem a little high, um, but uh, that's actually doesn't really come through um, in the finish specifically. Um, you know, we got we got a give or take 6% beer um, that actually is going to finish really crispy, really dry. Um, that's the whole point of a Mertzen. Um, that's something that actually people get misconstrued about because a lot of American breweries will attempt this style um, and they end up. Um, you know, throwing a whole bunch of Kara Munich, a whole bunch of other like crystal type malts in there, and they build up this big, thick, sweet beer. They're meant to be relatively simple and crisp and dry. And so if you're adding a lot of malts at it, you're probably doing it wrong. If you want to add technique to it, you can always do that. These were traditionally uh, decocted beers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keep the malts relatively simple in a style like this. Yeah, exactly. Keep the malts simple. Um, with that said, the color is also a pretty huge range too. So these can actually be pretty much a pale beer um, for at 8 SRM yep. and then ranging all the way up to 17 SRM, which is probably more of that classic um, dark, sort of, rich, amber. Yeah, yeah. That, that ambery color that uh, you're looking for. But you'll see a lot um, of commercial examples that come and they look like a pale beer. They're just well, I call it that orange color. It's not. Yeah, it's not that amber red. It's not getting into that amber hue. It's not quite a perfectly pale beer, but it's in that mid range. It's it's it looks like a pale beer, but with a little bit more color. Yeah. So ultimately, the um, perception of these beers when you drink them, um, they're going to they're going to hit you with, you know, a nice um, biscuity, malty aroma. They're going to follow through with, with a lot of richness, a lot of almost Maillardy type character um, in the middle of the palate, but then actually finish very crisp, um, leave you really wanting another sip. Um, and that's pretty indicative of a lot of um, German lagers in general. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, that is um, the start of a Meritzen for you. Um, so let's talk about how we're going to get there. Um, so our malt of the week we chose is going to be um, Best Malls. Um, light Munich. And this can be 100% of your malt bill. You don't have to get crazy with it. You don't have to do specialty malts. Uh, 100% best malts light Munich, which comes in at 6 SRM, will be perfect for getting you in that, that lighter end of the color range. Uh, if you want to go even lighter, you can do a combination of Munich and Vienna, but 100% Munich should be really, really flavorful. Have a lot of those toasty middle notes that you want, and it is powerful enough to convert itself completely. Yeah, so this is a traditional thing. Um, yeah, like Peter said, so it's it's um, a lighter colored malt, um, but it's got a lot of those those classic um, kind of light biscuit, um, just amazing bodied notes to it. And Speaking of amazing bodied notes. Oh, gosh. What? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, You're so being weird. can be up to 100% of the, of the grain bill. Typically, um, they're going to be 60 to 70%. Um, but yeah, so you're loading it up with Munich. Um, you're probably going to be looking at something like an extended boil as well, um, you, which you're actually not going to see in a lot of homebrew recipes. Um, but doing a 90-minute boil or even a two-hour boil isn't going to be in the end of the world. That's actually going to get you a little bit darker color. It's going to get you some of those Maillardy type um, flavors um, and ultimately give you that richness that you're going for without the additional sweetness and fun fact about long boils that a lot of people overlook it actually does make your beer more shelf stable uh, you usually end up with a beer that clarifies faster um, and it, it's popping those sugars and breaking those down in a way that makes it so that the beer actually ends up uh, coming out being a pretty clean beer relatively fast yeah um, so yeah that is going to be our best malls munich the malt of the week um, otherwise you're probably going to be you know buffering that with a little bit of um, Pilsner, um, possibly some melanoidin type malts if you want to sort of, you know, cheat around that long boil. Um, Get there a little faster or aromatic. Honestly, the we've used this malt as a malt a week before, but the Franco Belgian aromatic I think is yep. a fantastic one to throw into something like this. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to get anything too dark with your specialty malts um, if you do want to throw specialty malts at it. And if you put um, caramel malts in this, I will punch you. <laughs> 
right in the goiter. Um, all right. Anyway, our hop. Raise your hand if you would get punched for this. Th- Never mind. Okay. Our hop of the week um, is going to be Magnum, which, uh, yeah, it's not like a super cool hop, but uh, it w- uh, it's it's an under uh, underrecognized hop, and it is yeah. a very very widely used hop. I think a lot of people use it and don't necessarily know why it's so good. Uh, you'll see it commonly in light lagers uh, on low uh, in low amounts, uh, or you'll see it. It's really really common in like barley wines and stuff like that. Yeah, so Magnum is really known for um, being so for one, it's a high alpha hop, um, and then it's a bittering hop. It's fairly cheap <coughs> to get a hold of. Uh, and it just produces this clean, clean bittering effect. Um, originally bre- or released in 1980, so been around for a hot minute. Um, it's actually a daughter of Galena, which I didn't know until just now, um, and then a German male, um, which explains the higher alphas. And uh, yeah, so it's just known for that super clean. It's got a medium cohumulone level, which means you know that perceived bitterness is going to be kind of right in the middle of the range. Um, and uh, also, it seems to be really shelf stable, which means that. Um, those alpha acids, that bittering impact of the hop um, degrades a lot slower than especially like the, the big new world hops these days. Yeah, um, it's, it's been brew, or grown very, very commonly also because it's a high yield hop. It's a high yield hop that's also very stable out in the field. It's resistance to some things. Um, yeah, and upwards you get a, of 1,500 pounds per acre. Yeah. Um, fun facts, almost as uh, much yield as Peter has. Yeah, pretty close. Uh, so, <laughs> so that is, uh, yeah, so that's Magnum. Um, as for its use in this beer, um, you're actually going to be hitting it with a really small amount as your bittering addition. Um, you know, I wouldn't even worry about trying to finish it off because that's not what this beer is about. No. Um, so, yeah, you're going to be hitting this with, for a five-gallon batch, honestly less than even a half ounce for, for your 60-minute addition if I'm doing my math right. Um, you're going to be looking at probably somewhere about a third of an ounce is all. Yeah. Um, so, and it's going to get you in that, in that wheel house where you need to be. And, and that's it. You can call it a day for hops. So, um, so use Magnum cause why not? Uh, yeah. As for the yeast of the week, we went with Imperial Global. This is a yeast you'll see coming up pretty frequently. It's the classic Vine Step and Lager strain, and it is a yeast we use a lot because it's a really, really good, consistent yeast. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I was going to say, for those of you that watch this on a regular basis, um, you've probably seen us. I think this is the third or even fourth time that we've you know, used this Vine Step and strain. It's also um, the strain we use in our coffee Kolsch that is available on our website. Yep. So take a note of that. There's a reason why we keep using it so many times. It's because it's that good. It's that versatile. Um, And uh, the reason why, I mean, I specifically chose this over um, something like Harvest, which might be a little bit more of a traditional strain, um, is uh, just because um, it's going to really accentuate that dry finish. Um, The Harvest is nice, um, but it can throw some fruity notes, and it tends to have Um, a little bit softer finish and it doesn't have that super super intense like rip through at attenuation rate um, which is really what we're going for on a beer like this so harvest um, can also be a little bit sulfury which i personally like in a lot of my lagers um but it's you know overall it's not going to be uh it's not going to be the right the right mix yeah exactly. it'll work just fine don't get me wrong we're not saying yeah. don't use harvest you can, it'll, it'll be great for this style of beer there we go we got one person doing a uh, batch with lutra so nice i'm actually that i i don't see that turning out bad whatsoever so yeah i uh, actually we uh, convinced a local brewery to do because they started their uh river city did started their uh martin late they started it like two weeks ago and we were like oh really have we got the idea for you <laughs> <laughs> awesome well i'm excited to see how that turns out i'm sure they'll bring some by yeah they will um, so, okay, yeah, so that's going to be our yeast. And then as for water, um, best thing we could find on that is it's sort of just like middle of the road water. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's this should actually be really easy for most people to hit, to be honest. Um, slight malt leaning balance is what, what it looks like, but uh, yep. yeah. Yeah, so a little bit higher um, kind of uh, chloride to sulfate ratio there, um, and it's a pretty balanced uh, profile. The, the breakdown that I sort of threw on here, um, is going to be, you know, hitting that range of bicarbonates of about 120 ppm, um, followed up by about 75 um, ppm of some dissolved calcium, um, about 15, just a little bit of some magnesium, and then um, about 10 to 15 um, parts per million of sodium, followed up by um, 50 ppm of dissolved sulfates and 80 ppm of dissolved chloride. So just bumping up that ratio. Um, a little bit to kind of push through that malt, but otherwise pretty much balanced. Um, nothing. The world is your oyster. You can yeah, use a nothing, wide range. Nothing yeah. really crazy there. So um, yeah, water is is great on a Meertsen. Um, it gives you a wide range to work with. So. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, and I think that pretty much sums up our beer of the week. So. Yeah, so before we go into our discussion topics, if you have not already, go ahead and flap that thumbs up button. Flap that thumbs up. Um, again, please, if you want to support us, check out our website. We got swag. We got beer kits. Um, feel free to actually send us a um, message um, through our website, too, or even through Facebook. Facebook, um, Instagram. If you guys are interested works. and, you know, if you got a beer style that you've been really itching to brew um, and would like us to actually build up a kit for you, um, it's actually not that bad to do now. And, and uh, yeah, we can, we can do it and we can ship them out, so. Um, let us know, shoot us a message, and uh, yeah, we can make something happen. And let's go into topic number one, which is talking about brew house efficiency. Uh, what you're really looking at when you're looking at brew house efficiency versus something like mash efficiency. Uh, and then we're going to talk, give you some tips and tricks and some wherewithal on how to uh, make sure that you're doing something consistent every single time you brew with efficiency and uh, also maximize your efficiency. Yep. So brew house conf- efficiency is a, uh, I think people think want to think that they know more about it than they do. Uh, most home brewers actually really don't understand um, what these numbers mean. And, and uh, the number generally is expressed as a percentage. Uh, and what that actually says is it is the total sugars available or total, total sugars that you get into your fermenter is the proper way to measure it um, versus the total potential sugars of the grains that you're using in an all grain batch of beer. And this also takes into account volume, which is often overlooked because a lot of people will be like, Oh, I way overshot my gravity. I have, you know, exactly five gallons of, yeah. of, of higher gravity wort, and they don't realize that their thing was set to like 5.5 gallons or something like that. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's measuring volume is, is huge. Um, yeah, I can't tell you how many people come and be like, Oh yeah, totally hit 103% brew house efficiency on that batch of beer. And you're like, that's, that's impossible. not possible. <laughs> and, uh, but you do you. Uh, so yeah, so we're kind of going to just sort of dispel all these sort of myths about it and, uh, and really kind of break it down and, and let you know how all this works and then really where these, uh, losses come from. Um, because your typical brew house efficiency, uh, for a home brewer is going to fall usually right in that mid, um, seventies range. So 75% of the potential sugars that you have, um, to convert, um, actually get into your fermenter as fermentable wort. Now, when people are starting to uh, kind of troubleshoot or calculate out their brew house efficiency, the first thing they usually look at is how many starches got converted into sugars in their mash. And that's the number one place that you think about to look because that's the number one thing that you learn about how you're, what you're doing with your mash to get those sugars out. And so uh, there's a couple different ways that you can not get all the sugars out of your mash just from your mashing techniques. This could have to do with temperature. It could have to do with enzymes. It can have to do with lottering technique. Yeah, so let's start with um, the conversion in your mash. Um, So this happens when you'd go through um, your uh, sacrification rest, so your give or take 150 degree mark um, when you're mashing in those grains, uh, and you have enzymes that are going to go to town, that they're going to convert those starches into sugar, um, but very rarely do you get a 100% conversion, and generally that's just because Um, Not all those starches are going to kind of come out of the grains. Not all of them are going to get hit by the enzymes. Um, But uh, using higher amounts of adjuncts um, can inhibit this. It can slow down that process. So that 60-minute mash time might actually not be quite enough for you. Um, But for the most part, if you do have a, um, you know, pale malt or a highly modified malt of any sort in there, um, you're going to get... Um, a pretty high conversion rate, typically, you know, 97, 98%. Um, So so if you are experiencing losses or you're experiencing a lack of conversion, um, you might want to actually look at your base malt and make sure that you have enough um, what's called diastatic power, which is the amount of those enzymes in there to properly convert your mash. Think of it like this. There's a random chance that an enzyme is going to come in contact with the starch. Uh, at the very beginning of your mash, that chance is very, very high. And then the curve kind of regresses in a way that, you know, there's fewer enzy- or there's fewer starches and the same amount of enzymes or fewer enzymes because of degradation over time. So towards the end of all the conversion, it's kind of just not quite hitting 100%, but it's getting closer, just nearing 100% conversion. Um, and so uh, what uh, a base malt, like 100% uh, two-row pale that Logan was talking about, that not only has a lot of enzymes, it also has a lot of sugars that are already kind of ready to go. Uh, and so the, the contact is a little bit faster. But when you have uh, a lot of adjuncts, not only are there less enzymes and less uh, uh, 
not less sugars, but less starches that are ready to get eaten by sugar, uh, by enzymes. Uh, there's also what are called beta glucans, which kind of can affect uh, how much flowability or how much contact uh, the liquid has with all the starches. Yeah, so now we're getting into the step where we've gone through that conversion and uh, those beta glucans actually tend to kind of glob onto things. They're gonna gum up your mash, um, which means that once you start to actually try to drain that sugar water off, um, these can have a pretty significant impact on how that drains. Um, you can end up with issues like channeling. Um, you, can also, uh, you can also end up with um, just overall um, lack of uh, sort of rinsing from sparging, um, which end up leaving a lot of sugars in the mash itself. Um, and this is actually a big part of inefficiency in the brewing process. Um, most people don't realize that you know, when they're, when they're um, sparging out their mash tun and they're getting down and they're getting full, um, take a gravity sample of your last runnings. Odds are you're gonna have, um, you know, 10, uh, a gravity reading of, uh, you know, 1010 or 1015. Um, and what that means is there's still sugars in your mash tun. And there's really not a good way to avoid that. Um, and you're going to have losses regardless there. This is usually gonna make up, um, I would say five to 10% of your losses, depending on your mash tun. Sparge it and squeegee it all out. Squeegee it all out, yes. Um, so yeah, so and- Just Peter's get 30 gallons about, in your boil and then boil it for yeah. five days. Yeah, so if you do have things that are um, like a hazy, for instance, that does have um, a lot of those like oats and flaked wheat um, that have those like high, high amounts of beta glucans in there, um, the, you, you know, the best way to attack that is going to be um, uh, to slow down your sparge um, and then also we'll talk about it just a little bit later um, but also adding enzymes to help with that so. yeah so uh, uh, you can also try things like a protein rest or just a longer mash time in general uh, um, so we do uh, yeah. yeah we'll do like ramped we'll start we'll mash in at like 130 and then we'll do a ramped uh, kind of mash overnight that gets us up to 160 in like eight hours and that uh, yeah. That makes us really consistent. Yeah, and I know like the one thing that I've had that I've brewed a couple times in the past is, is trying to brew a Kentucky Common style, um, which is actually like 50% adjunct load. Yeah. I have noticed where, where I was running a, you know, my, my uh, brewing system at home where it was just like spot on every time. That one, I had a huge hit in efficiency, and I think I just needed to do like a two-hour mash on it just because it was so high in adjuncts. Um, that it just didn't have those zymes uh, uh, chance to kind of really get in there and convert everything. So all that to say, one way to lose efficiency is you're not able to rinse all the sugars off your grain because beta-glucans create layers. Yep. Uh, so, so let's go into other losses because there's also a lot of losses in, let's do dead space first and then we'll go on to what happens in the boil. Yeah, so dead space um, is <clears throat> uh, a term that's going to be thrown out there. And what dead space means is it means that is the space in any one of your brewing vessels um, that you're just not going to get liquid out of. So yeah, that's um, your pumps. That's a lot of your tubing yep. uh, under your false bottom. If you have a false bottom in your mash tun, there's always some liquid in there. Uh, and all that's just, it's, it doesn't add up to a ton, but it is something you need to calculate for yeah. uh, and losses. In bigger systems, uh, like on the... It definitely can, though. Yeah, well, yeah. I, can't, I was going to say on the seven barrel system we use downtown, there's probably 30, you know, 15 to 30 gallons just in loss from dead space in the system. Yep, so <laughs> yeah, and even your brew, uh, brew house at home, I mean, I think I figured um, almost a third of a gallon um, by the time you're running things, like you said. Through your, through your hoses, through like if you got a counter flow chiller. Yeah, that can um, add up quite a bit. And then dead space in your mash tun as well, yeah. yeah. That dead space in your mash tun can actually add up to like almost a half gallon sometimes. So Yeah, so let's um, go on to the boil. Obviously there's dead space oh, uh, and in uh, your fermenter too, you can also count for losses in that, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so going on to the boil, uh, the number one thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize how big of an impact it has on things like IPAs is hop absorption, because that can account for a lot of liquid loss. Yeah, so fun facts, when you add hops to beer, they actually absorb some of that wort, um, and you're not really getting that back out of them, because it's, it's falling down the bottom, it's going to have that big, that big true cake down there on the bottom of... Uh, of hop materials and uh, yeah they're actually absorbing your wort so um, that can make up especially for these new world ipas a very very significant amount of losses um, i mean yeah if you're throwing 12 ounces of hops out of beer um, that could be a half gallon of your wort that's absorbing yeah i was gonna say i um, think it's pretty reasonable to calculate about uh, a gallon per pound of hops that you're losing somewhere yeah. in that range so um so yeah that's one thing to consider as well um, that's something that uh, you definitely want to take into consideration when you're um, building up these hazies. That's also why a lot of times you'll see little bigger grain bills. 
Um, so yeah, don't be surprised if your efficiency takes a big hit when you start throwing eight or 12 ounces of hops um, at a five gallon batch of beer. I mean, I would be impressed if you hit much more than 70, to be honest, um, especially if you're using traditional hops. Uh, Hayden and Matt want to know if we want to do a Zapdos raid in a couple minutes. <sighs> Peter. Well, I mean, I can, I can tap and talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so it's, um, hop absorption is a major thing that you have to consider. Um, also consider hop absorption when you're dry hopping these beers too. Um, you're also going to lose um, beer in your fermenter. Um, so I always tell people, you know, shoot a little bit higher um, for your pre-boil gravities on those beers. Um, and just calculate out to a higher volume whenever you're doing heavily hopped beers. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So hop absorption is uh, the other way that you can lose efficiency. So ultimately, um, these guys add up to typically that 25% give or take of, of your losses, um, which, you know, 10% here, 5% there. Um, yeah, it adds up pretty quick. And so getting over 80% efficiency um, with a true calculation actually is pretty difficult. Uh, and it, it can happen if you're doing everything the, the really, really good, correctly way. Yeah, so speaking of which, so let's, let's talk about the right way to do it. So in order to really get an accurate reading of your brew house efficiency, um, you really need to have accurate volume measurements um, in your fermenter itself um, and then an accurate way to take the gravity of the beer that hits that. Um, like Peter mentioned earlier, I think where most people go wrong is, uh, is in the, the fermenter volume. Um, people tend to take accurate readings of their gravity pretty easily, um, but they're not accurately um, taking a reading of their fermenter volume. Um, and the difference between five gallons and five and a half gallons um, can actually have a significant impact on uh, your brew house efficiency. Almost so like approximately 10%. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what is significant? I don't know. Yeah. Is it 0.05, uh, 5%? Yeah. But I mean, some people that are getting, you know, five, uh, five gallons on a five and a half uh, estimated thing, that is a 10% jump in efficiency. Yeah. Uh, and so you'd, you'd be surprised how much. You know, when people are like, I got 93% efficiency, you know, maybe it's just a little bit less volume. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And most, most um, five gallon recipes are not actually for exactly five gallons. Um, almost all of them will take into consideration um, losses in your fermenter so that when it comes to basically bottling or kegging day, you end up with five gallons of beer then. Um, I know I usually try to figure them for about five and a third gallons. Like, like Peter said, some of them are going to be five and a half. Um, if it's heavily hopped yeah yeah it just depends on mm -hmm. the beer um and that way you kind of end up with the final volume um uh, which a lot of people also don't consider so um yeah so that's pretty much um uh how to measure brew house efficiency and um where all those losses are coming from so now let's just go into um how we're going to maximize that i'm just trying to see if the table isn't getting some interference oh some people are getting some noise. Let me know. Math nerds. <laughs> Thanks, so is it just Derek. Your gravity efficiency multiplied by your volume efficiency? Uh, sort of. It is linear, which makes it pretty easy to, to calculate out, both in efficiency and in volume. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so let's talk about ways to maximize that efficiency. The first and probably the easiest for a lot of people to do, and I see it done early on, is a bigger sparge and a longer boil. Yeah, so um, if you, it's, it's a basic equation. If you're rinsing out more sugars from your mass, um, you don't have those losses. They're getting into your boil. Doing a longer boil means that um, you're going to boil off a higher rate and condense those sugars back down. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward one. You're going to have higher efficiencies regardless. That's why, um, especially for higher alcohol beers um, like barley wines, like imperial stouts, um, you know, a lot of Belgian beers, um, you're going to have those extended boils. Um, and that's just because um, you're wasting a lot of sugar when you're cutting off your gravity at like 10, 10 30. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of sugar left in there. There's a lot of sugar left in there. It's also why people do Barty guile beers. So. Party guile. Yeah. Not Barty guile. I just, did I say Barty guile. Yeah. Uh, Bartleby guile. Bar um, Bartleby's. So if you are planning on doing a high alcohol beer, uh, then go ahead and plan on rinsing off a little bit extra and doing a longer boil. The longer boil is going to help the flavor of the beer. And then also you're just going to get a little bit more efficiency off it. The other option would be, Bartle, Bartleby Guile. <laughs> Bartleby Guile. Um, yeah, so the next thing is going to be a slower sparge. A lot of times, um, like we talked about earlier, um, if you've got a higher adjunct load or it just kind of depends on your system too. Um, if it's some, more vertical. Yeah, exactly. If you've got a deeper um, grain bed that you're trying to sparge through, um, slowing down that sparge, not just basically throwing a bunch of water, letting it rinse through real fast, um, can actually help out your efficiency 
um, in a couple of ways. Um, and that's, you know, for one, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get that channeling. Um, you're not going to lose as much from just the overall. Um, it's got longer times to absorb the shiggies. Yep. Uh, and, and then it's also not compacting the grain bed. And so you, we talked about those beta glucans earlier. Uh, those beta glucans, they, they, they are hydrophobic. They push away water. And so if those beta glucans compact into more of a flat layer, then it's sending your sparge water over into a different direction. That's what we mean by channeling. And so by slowing your sparge, you're keeping your grain bed nice and fluffy and you're eliminating that potential compaction, which can ruin your efficiency. Yeah. So ultimately doing that's going to give you uh, more sugars from the mash into your kettle. Um, the other way to do it is to minimize dead space losses with quality equipment. So that means uh, it could be the difference of a false bottom without a dip tube and a false bottom with a dip tube. Yeah, so, um, or even, you know, I do know like SS Brewtech makes some, um, uh, you know, getting a mash ton that actually doesn't have any dead space. Um, yeah. That'll definitely bump your efficiency up. Um, I would say, you know, by probably a 5% or so. Yeah, um, it, it can uh, it can definitely have a significant impact. Bottom port mash tons do cost a lot, but it, you know if you think about it in terms of getting that extra five or ten percent every time, yeah, you know it can make a big difference. So yeah, it definitely adds up over time, especially if you brew every week like um, some people do. So yeah, um, and last but not uh, least, we've talked about how um, how you might not be getting full conversion in your mash due to low diastatic power. Uh, and we've also talked about beta glucans. These both can be solved with an ingredient called enzymes. Uh, and specifically, the ones that we use uh, are uh, Amylex 4T, which is a mash enzyme. It can also be uh, known as OptiMash from a different vendor. Um, that's going to give you more enzymes to get you to maximize your conversion. And then to eliminate those beta glucans, which can lower your efficiency, we have something called ViscoBuster. Yep. So uh, those two enzymes, the ViscoBuster is actually going to um, break up those. It, is it a beta amylase? Beta gluconase. Uh, beta gluconase. That's yeah. A, yeah, beta gluconase. That's what I meant to say. Um, yeah, so that's actually going to break down those uh, beta glucans in there. Um, so depending on what you're going for, this might not be the best idea just because those also contribute significantly to the body of the beer. Um, but, you know, for something like a Mertzen, might not be the end of the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, just kind of thin that beer out and make it super, super sessionable. Um, but, yeah, so adding enzymes we have them available these days in fact i'm going to make peter link them down in the description of this video sure um, if you do want to check those guys out because uh, they have been a game changer for us especially um, for just speeding up the whole process and for kind of having little tricks up our sleeves for you know like i just mentioned a Mertzen. Um, i know we've done some west coast style um, ipas or we hit you know a little bit of alpha amylase right at the right at the end of the uh, uh, mash there just to dry that out. So we end up, you know, with a 1060 beer that goes down to like 07 or 08 and just yeah. gets bone dry for us um, without having to add corn sugar, which is always awesome. And uh, yeah, so there's there's a million different uses for these guys and uh, they're fairly inexpensive and they go a long way. So yeah, they, yeah, they, uh, one little bottle of something like Amalex 4T, uh, I think is good for 105 gallons for a yeah. four ounce bottle and it's like an $8 bottle. So. so yeah, so definitely something if you are the hardcore brewer, you should definitely have that in your, in your arsenal. Yeah, and one, so. one more thing about having something like the, uh, the mash enzymes, the, like the Amalex 4T, which is also uh, the OptiMash, uh, something like that, if you were to, let's say you accidentally mash in at like 156 degrees. Yeah, that's you've, a great you've point. Just, you've just killed a lot of your beta amylase. Uh, you've killed a good chunk of your alpha amylase. So you wait for that to get back down to like 152. Then you go ahead and add in your enzymes that you already have stored, and you've just saved your brew. So it's a good thing to just have on hand. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, and that pretty much sums up um, our first topic on brew house efficiency. I realized that was kind of a mouthful. Um, so let's just sort of like cap this one off to say um, the big, uh, what is it, qualifier here. <laughs> yeah. Um, to say make that sure it's worth your time to do these things. Like if you if, make sure that you have a consistent overall process and don't be focusing on maximizing efficiency before focusing on making sure your con efficiency is consistent. Yeah. So we have way too many of our you know customers <clears throat> that come in here and they just get hung up on, Oh, I'm trying to get high efficiency. Oh man, my efficiency is low, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and oh, time after time, we kind of have to tell them, don't worry about, what you're getting um, worry more about the consistency of it so that you can actually plan ahead um, for your beer because and adjust accordingly because um, yeah while you know turning your 30 minute sparge into a two hour sparge might get you another five percent of of uh, you know efficiency out of your batch um, is that two hours worth 
uh, a half pound, uh, one pound of base malt, which is, you know, a dollar sixty-five. <laughs> so that's something that you definitely have to consider. Um, that you know, as long as you hit it consistently, you know, you can always throw a little bit of extra grains into your recipe um, and kind of kind of go from there. So always consider your time and whether you want to be doing a four-hour brew day or whether you want to be doing a fourteen-hour brew day. Um, so yeah, that's the big qualifier. I'm gonna stop right there and uh, yeah, we'll get yeah. into topic number two now. Yeah, at the end of the day, people are uh, are, are spending four hours so that they can save like two dollars in grain. Yeah, yeah. See, that, <laughs> and that's the thing, and so that's kind of the big qualifier there. Yeah. So take take all that into consideration. You know, if you think that there might be something that you're doing terribly wrong and getting a huge loss on, it might be a simple fix for you. Um, but otherwise, if you're shooting for those uh, that two percent, that three percent of efficiency, um, try not to fret that. Um, and Def garage, garage brewing nailed it. Consistency is more important than efficiency. Exactly, yeah, because then you can plan. Then you can plan ahead for your next batch, and you don't end up with 8% Mertzens. Um, how, how, uh, how, do, how do galaxies uh, like to throw parties? Uh, with the universe? They, they plan it. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's get right on to topic number two. We'll, uh, we'll try to actually get through this guy a little bit more speedy so that we can uh, answer some questions before we have to open here. Yeah, someone um, already had a question about their first batch is going to be a Bohemian-style Pilsner. Well, here are tips and tricks for nailing lagers every time. Perfect. Um, so tip number one is going to be to simplify your grain bill. Like we talked about in our Martin breakdown, um, simple is almost always going to end up better because it allows you to focus more on the methods uh, the worst thing I see is when people come in, um, they're trying to brew lagers, especially traditional German lagers, um, and they've got a list of five or six different adjunct malts in there, and you're just going, why are these in here? You don't need it. Um, um, oh yeah, great, fantastic lager beers can be fermented, or can be done as single malts. Um, if there's anything that we're probably gonna add first and foremost, it's usually a little bit of acid malt just for pH adjustment, but that can be done with water chemistry in the first place, so try a single malt. Yeah, basically try a single malt, um, and, it, and it's a great way to try out some really good quality malts, um, especially if you have a smaller local maltster. Um, yeah. that they tend to work out fantastic that There's way. There's great flavors in a lot of those malts um, by themselves. Right. Yeah, so uh, step number two is going to be step mashing. And, uh, you know, a lot of these lagers have that, that classic just clean, clean, um, crisp finish, highly attenuated, I believe, is the... Uh, is the sort of buzzword that goes around those. Um, and a lot of that can be due to step mashing. Um, yeah, so step mashing, uh, like I said, we like to do that in a, uh, uh, in a kind of a graduated uh, method. And so we mash in at 130 and then we do a recirculation and it takes us, we do this overnight. Um, and so we come back the next morning to beer that is already out at mash out and it has gone through all those different mash rests. Um, but the biggest thing uh, is a lot of these Pilsner malts, these light malts that you're gonna be using for lagers have a high protein content. So if you want them really crispy, uh, then it's a good idea to start with a protein rest at about 130 degrees and then go up to your sacrification rest at 150. So uh, yeah, so that's definitely something to consider. Um, there, there's a little bit more on that, including um, what's called malt modification, um, but we've actually done some other videos. So do a Google search on uh, malt modification and uh, you'll kind of get an idea of which ones are going to be better to do step mashes on versus which ones you might be wasting your time on. Yes. Um, so uh, step tip number three um, is going to be longer boils. Um, and yeah, just like what we talked about before, yeah. Maillard reactions, right? Maillard reactions do a couple things. They build complexity. They make your beer have a nice malt, uh, malt roundness without being sweet. And they also uh, can uh, impact the clarity. They can make sure that your beer gets nice and crispy and clear early on. And they make your beer more shelf stable, which if you're doing a lager, yeah. it's meant to be stored. It's in the name. Oh, uh, lagered. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, you're building up just more complexity in the beer by having those extended boils. Um, yeah. Again and again, I feel like that, that has a bigger impact than anything, I think, on traditional um, German lagers is just having that that really complex uh, Maillard character to these beers and uh, it can turn a simple beer into a beautiful simple beer exactly yeah and that's when you have you know perhaps just a Pilsner malt um, having those in there um, take that Pilsner malt and turn it into something amazing and complex um, beyond what you would expect yeah so if there's, if there's one thing that's the, just the easiest thing to do all it takes is a little extra time is do a longer boil with your lagers uh, I guarantee you it will make that consistency 
Yeah. Actually, no, there is one more thing that I think is more important, and that's the next one. Next one. Speaking of next one, that's tip number four, and that is build up your yeast. Your yeasts yes. are what do everything for you, and um, especially lager yeast. Um, they actually ferment a little bit differently than aerial yeast. Um, they tend to be smaller cells, um, and they tend not to be as metabolically active. Um, so, Especially because the temperature that you often ferment them at. Yeah, well, there's that too. Um, but uh, yeah, so these yeast, um, you want to... Um, the general rule of thumb is to double your pitch rate compared to an ale. Um, but honestly, I would even go three or four times the pitch rate um, if you can. So, you know, get your yeast packs, build those up in starters. Um, make sure you've got tons and tons of really healthy yeast. Um, that's going to ensure your beer finishes out, ensure that you don't have any kind of off flavors um, that might be due to yeast health, and just really keep those beers as absolutely clean as possible. Yep, and we, if you want to hear a little bit more on that, we did do a video on five tips just to improve all your beers, which we cover both yeast health or yeast building up and oxygen. So uh, consider buying two packs of yeast if you're doing a lager yeast or buy a, a pack from Imperial, which is a 200 billion cell count to begin with, and then doing a big starter, something like a two or three liter starter for that batch of beer. Yep. Um, all right. And uh, can, can you say it? I want to I want to pop in as Beetlejuice right now <laughs> for tip number five. Water chem, water chem, water chem. Boom. Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Beetlejuice. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag. Our jokes up, are on point today. In the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say that just like all our jokes and references today are just we're nailing them. Like, uh. why are we not a comedy channel by now? <laughs> So, yeah, so um, tip number five is water chemistry. Um, for delicate beers like lagers, especially on your paler lagers, um, uh, quite honestly, a big difference between something like a Hellas and something like a Czech Pilsner um, is going to have a lot to do with the water chemistry Absolutely. Um, that you're brewing with. So, so please, please don't overlook this and, uh, and uh, make sure that you are doing research on the beer style that you're trying to brew, the lager style that you're trying to brew, um, and then actually do some serious water chemistry. Um, this might even mean building up your profile from absolute scratch. So yeah, buy distilled um, water and then just build up your broader profile yeah. to match what you want. A lot of German style lagers are a little bit heavy in the chlorides and that's a big part of the flavor builder yeah. um, because it impacts the malts so much. Yeah. So and I know one of the best Pilsners that we did um, when we actually, that was the only beer I think we've ever done from scratch with, with uh, distilled water. Yeah. And uh, it was, quite frankly, one of the best Pilsners that we've ever made. So just goes to show how big of an impact water chemistry can have. So, um, and then our last tip, tip number six, um, is going to be don't fear the finings. Um, yes, if you're doing a lager, you want that beer to be clear. And yes, if you lager it for two months, more than likely it'll get there, but you don't have to. Yeah. So uh, if you want to get a nice crispy boy, in let's say three to five weeks uh, then go ahead and use findings as long as your beer is fully attenuated and completely done um, we always recommend a two-stage finding uh, finding agent we start with kytosan um, and then uh, a day and a half later we add kiesel sol. Uh, sorry reverse those kiesel sol first then kytosan uh, and this can be bought together in one package called super clear uh, which is available on amazon and i can link that yep. i can link Highly that after recommended. it's gonna run you like four or five bucks is all um, so yeah, something that can really help speed up the time it takes from um, your beer to being fermented to when you're putting it in your mouth. Um, so yeah, don't fear those. You know, it's it's Ryan Ryan Heights Gebot time that we change tradition. Yeah, we need to get more of those shirts. Speaking that's of a, yeah, that's a, that's a good pun. Uh, <laughs> Do you guys get it? <laughs> no, Did you pun. get it? Yeah. So yeah, we're we don't have to abide by the German purity laws. Um, add some findings to your beer. Make it super clear. Make it super delicious. No need to wait for three months. So yeah, or you can always buy a thirty thousand dollar centrifuge. That'll take care of it too. Um, yeah. Your choice on which one you want to do. A five hundred dollar plate filter. That'll do it too. Yeah, it'll get the job yeah. done. Yeah. I don't like filtration though. I'm I'm not. I feel like it just it, it kills beer. Anyway. That's my two cents. So that is the end of topic number two. So yeah, that was kind of uh, hot and fast for y'all and. Uh, let us know what your favorite uh, what your favorite tip that we had today was. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. If you learned something and you enjoyed today's uh, show, let us know what your favorite tip is. Now we'll go into some questions. Also, smash that like button, everybody. We only got 52 likes right now and 144 yeah. people watching. So. Slap the su subscribe switch. Yeah, the switch. Subscribe. Hey, I'm subscribed. That's cool. 
Um, I'm not subscribed. I'm also not logged in, but there you go. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, at this point, we're going to open it up to our general questioning. Um, so yeah, throw your questions in the comments and uh, we're going to scroll back up and see which ones we've already had. Yeah, if you need some, uh, like if you need some, some QB picks for today before game start at 10 a.m., then go ahead and let me know. Uh, I got some sleepers for you. Tips for next week's waiver wire. Uh, Whatever you need. Three mil I Tony got is it. after my heart, by the way. He says, just say no to Crystal. <laughs> Wait, that, uh, that could be a shirt we make. Yeah. Just say no to Crystal. Uh, just say, yeah. Like in the Dare, uh, the, like the Dare logo style kind of uh, thing. Hey, somebody's down in Tri Cities. Do you Very guys nice. from, uh, yeah, Baldo 509. Uh, take a deep breath, by the way. Ah. Oh. The air is so nice. nice of, now. Yeah, the rain kind of cleared it up. Uh -oh. Do you guys ferment with wild yeast to sour in your commercial brewery? If so, what are your cleaning slash CIP practices? Uh, yes, we actually do. We have barrels that are very open and very near to a lot of our fermenters. Uh, basically, kill how, it with fire. Yeah, we kill it with fire. We do boiling hot water through our fermenter as a uh, through a fermenter and heat exchanger as a last step before uh so uh, the fermenter is already cleaned and acided and then as a last step before actually finishing our boil and moving our beer into the fermenter we back flush the fermenter with boiling water and then also goes through our heat exchanger every point that it can possibly touch yeah. uh up into the kettle and then it just, we just dump that and then put our beer through in the reverse direction sometimes if we got it it can even be boiling acid so yeah um yeah but yeah basically heat is your friend that is the beauty of having so much stainless in you know a commercial warehouse warehouse not warehouse um brewery yeah and uh <laughs> and so yeah kill it with heat um even the barrels themselves uh we'll hit them with a whole bunch of sulfite um boil up some water fill like half the barrel with it um and then kind of kind of rotate it um, and that's actually going to kill a lot of the bugs that are in there if we want to really kind of neutralize a barrel. Yeah, fire is your friend. Um, someone says, morning from Oaxaca, Mexico. Oh, wow. Send me some radishes. Send you radishes? Yeah, Oaxaca radishes are really awesome. Oh. Like, Oh, you're wanting them. To, okay, I thought they were asking us to send them radishes. No, no, yeah, like, I, want, like, I want radishes from Oaxaca. Uh, they are super tasty. They're like a, they're like a snack. They taste like a chip. Yeah. Um, all right, so we got uh, Tito's asking um, – does it make sense to grind your flaked oats um, or wheat for high gravity IPAs? Uh, and the simple answer for that is, is no. Um, there's no need to do it. Um, those have all been pre-gelatinized. Um, so yeah, there's, they're probably just gonna gum up your mill if you try to run them through there. So. Yeah, they're a, they're a mill hazard. So you do not run them through your mill. No, and they, yeah, all the, all the stuff you want off those are ready to go on the outside. You don't have to worry about getting those crushed up. Question for the Q&A, I have a sourdough starter. Would it also be classified as wild yeast and would it beer? Uh, yeah, it yeah. would beer. Uh, you're gonna get a very, very random results. You, yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, more than likely, yeah, cause you got a mixed culture in there, um, almost guaranteed. Uh, yeah, you're gonna get some, you're gonna get some funky farmhouse beer out of the result, but- uh, But it will beer. More than likely it will end up being beer. I know uh, the Grain Shed actually has done that on a few different occasions now. Yeah. Um, so where they with took, mixed results. Yeah, with mixed results. Uh, well, I know one of them turned out really good. Yeah, the last one uh, that we had was really good. Well, I mean, the, none of them were bad, bad, but some, some of them were just were like a little bit. They're like, "Whoo, that's a little funky." Yeah, like ah, not what I want to drink right now. <laughs> but some of them were really, really good. So it, it's always worth a try. I would just try it with a very, very cheap recipe. Yep, there you go. That way, that way, if it's like it's a little bit too strong for you, just throw bread at it. There, <laughs> right. Honestly, any sort of hopping will also select against a lot of the things that you don't want doing yeah. work on your beer. So, uh -huh. you know, hop to at least, you know, 20 IBUs or something like that, and you should be fine. So an amber balanced type of water profile for the Martin. Yeah, basically, uh, the nice thing about anything that's in that amber color uh, is it's relatively buffers against a lot of pHs. So uh, if you're Martin, you're aiming for, you know, I would say anything 13 to 18, um, uh, Love Bond or SRM, then it will be... It'll be good. So, um, um, we got uh, somebody's asking, asking for tips on hitting a eight percent hazy IPA for a little bit higher gravity. Um, yeah, just you know, up your grain bill. Um, like we talked about, actually, in our brew house efficiency, um, figure your efficiency to drop too. Um, that's one thing we actually didn't mention was was that oh cryo uh, hops too. Uh, uh, yeah, cryo hops. Um, those are going to help you out a lot, um, getting rid of that bracked material, all that vegetal matter. They can and, absorb water. Uh, yeah, absorb lots of water. Um, but then also, yeah, um, as a general rule of thumb, the higher alcohol you're shooting for in your beer, 
um, the lower your efficiency is going to be. Right. Um, on a 10% beer, I mean, a 60% brew house efficiency is actually pretty par for the course. Um, so that's yeah. why you plan on party gals. And that's why you plan on party gals. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so definitely, um, yeah, bump up your base malt. I, I think you'll be good. Throw some, so throw some cryo hops in there, especially if you're dry hopping. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And you use a, an enzymatic base malt. We like to use we, uh, any of our high alcohol hazies that we do here. We use Heidelberg as at least half of our base malt. Um, it's highly enzymatic. It's got a lot of good proteins that actually kind of help that haze. Yeah. Um, chit is also wonderful in, uh, in, uh, high alcohol hazy IPAs. So, yeah. Um, Derek's asking about, uh, doing a brew in a bag method. And, you know, I, th I think, th I think somebody else also hinted at efficiencies with that and how, um, that would affect things. And he says he does a dunk sparging method in a separate kettle for about 30 minutes. Uh, and yeah, I can actually see that working out pretty well. Brew in a bag, you're typically going to fall in the lower end of the range. Uh, and a lot of that just happens to do come from a couple things. It's the fact that you're diluting those enzymes. Um, so, you know, that 97 or 98 percent um, conversion rate might actually be a little bit lower. Um, it might be closer to, you know, 92, 95, I don't know, somewhere in there. Um, and then longer also, mash. Yeah. And then, yeah. So a little bit longer mash might not hurt that. But also, um, usually you're going to end up leaving a lot of sugars in that bag when you go to pull it out. So um, doing a dunk sparge. Sure. I don't see anything really wrong with that unless you got like super, super alkaline water. Um, that's that's gonna like try to lower or raise that mash pH too high, but very rarely that's the case. So I would say unless you're getting issues with tannins, no worries there. Can I talk about something that I've seen uh, a couple of YouTubers doing, and then also Brewlosophy doing with the, like the short and shoddy brew methods and everything like that? Because uh, in perfect mash conditions, a lot of your a lot of your starches can be converted in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, like 15 like, minutes exactly. And so a lot of people have been taking that. And extrapolating that to it's a good idea for everyone to be able, like there's no need for there, there are a lot of people saying there's no need for a 60 minute mash and you really got to consider that that is for perfect mash conditions and perfect grists like this is not yeah it, there there are a lot of uses where a 60 minute or a longer mash can actually be really really helpful and so it's not like this universal thing just because in perfect conditions it has been shown that there's not a lot of conversion that takes place after that 15 minutes doesn't mean that there aren't ancillary benefits to consistently planning on a 60 minute or more mash. Yeah, and it makes your, honestly, that's the other great time about 60 minutes is it makes your day a little bit easier. Uh, it allows yeah. you to get some sparge water heated up, allows, you know, things to just kind of go a little bit smoother and you're not like, oh crap, now I gotta do this step, now I gotta do that step, so. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's more than just, uh, than just trying to do it as fast as possible. Yeah. So, so I've seen, I just see, I've seen a lot of other, I've seen other YouTubers and other people just kind of relying on that 20 to, you know, 20 ish minute mash. And it's just like, it's not, it's not good general practice for, and when we talk about things, we talk knowing that we're talking to a very, very broad audience, some very experienced home brewers and some very inexperienced home brewers. And so we try to put out the information that's going to make everybody make the best beer possible and not just certain people that know all the, the ins and outs. Somebody says you ran into a screen door with your forehead. That was Hayden. <laughs> Hayden, why are you oh, making fun of me? Was it actually Hayden? I didn't see that. Yeah. Why are you making fun of me, Hayden? Uh, did you Wait, did you actually run into a screen door? No, I put a suction cup thing on my forehead, oh my and God. it made like a little hickey. It was like I don't even notice it until I look at the camera. Yeah, and then you see Yeah. You <laughs> see <it. laughs> yep. Uh, yep. Somebody's saying add an extra grains. Somebody says Pilsner time. Uh, would a hundred percent Heidelberg malt lager need a ninety-minute boil to get rid of DMS like normal Pilsner does? Uh, and the answer is no. Probably not. Um, yeah, DMS is very rarely an issue that you're going to run into, um, especially in highly modified malts. Yeah, especially in Heidelberg. Um, definitely no. But again, back to those extended boils and just creating uh, more complexity in your beer it still wouldn't be the worst idea to do a little bit longer boil. So the reason behind that is most modern malts are very, very low, if any, uh, SMM, which is S-methylmethionine. That is the precursor to DMS. Uh, and because of the modification process, basically that's taken out in malting. Um, the only reason that you will be risking DMS is if your malt itself is oxidized, because that means that there is something called DMSO in your malt, and that does need to be boiled out. But if your malt is stored properly or it's relatively fresh malt, there's really not a high risk with either Pilsner malt or um, Heidelberg malt. Yep, that's that's kind of a thing of the past to you. And unless you're doing like, um, you might run into it with if, if you're doing a no chill method, um, depending on, you know, even if you don't have uh, a highly modified malt. 
Um, but otherwise, too, yeah, generally you're chilling. Because that kind of happens in that sort of really, really slow cooling process is when that'll end up coming out, too. Um, so if you can chill in a you know reasonable amount of time, which most most home brewers will chill actually way faster than commercial guys do, um, there's no need for that. So I pitched SO4 with some extra MJ enzymes, and the fermentation seems to be finished in three days flat on a five-gallon batch. Does that sound right, or am I sitting with a stuck fermentation? No, sounds like it tore through it. Yeah, that's um, perfectly that happens. People, a lot of people get freaked out when their fermentation yeah, actually finishes in like three days, and like it's uh, yeah. that. That happens. That's a good thing. Your yeast went ham. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it means your they probably made really neutral, happy. good beer. Um, so he's saying always had good luck with massive yeast starters. Yep, they just they're they're insurance is what yeast starters are, right? I mean, you can make good beer without them, but uh, you'll make more consistent beer with them. Born to um, be guile. Someone made that reference, so figured I'd sing it out for everybody. <laughs> Um, Somebody made a IPA that finished at uh, 997. Nice. I think Hayden responded to that. You <laughs> should test your hydrometer against yeah. water. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like it's like that would be impressive. Um, that would mean that you made like a uh, – If you did AMG, that's possible. Don't I mean, get me wrong. I mean, but yeah, you made a 10% beer that has zero sugars left in it. <laughs> not the, like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, someone mentioned that Ultra Foam Max from Novazymes is another product with beta gluconase. Uh, and yeah, so Novazymes is a new, uh, I, I don't know if they're super new, but I've just seen them pop up a lot lately, a new enzyme company for brewers, which seems like they have good products, but I have not gotten those products yet. And so I don't know too much about it. Uh, yeah, I've, I, I feel like I saw them somewhere actually. Yeah, I've, I've seen them advertised on our Instagram mm. a lot. Um, can amyloglucosidase be added in both the mash and the fermenter? Yes, it can. I actually prefer uh, OptiMash and, uh, and or amylox 4 t to amyloglucosidase. So in the mash, amyloglucosidase is definitely a good mash enzyme. It does work um, just the same as, you know, alpha and beta amylase. But the amylox 4 t or the OptiMash, which is the OptiMash is a blend of enzymes, actually is, high, uh, is better, is more temperature tolerant. So it can actually survive up to 160 degrees, whereas AMG degrades pretty rapidly at 150 degrees. So yeah. I prefer the amylox 4 t or the OptiMash. Uh, we got Travis is asking us if we're going to be using the uh, Philly Sour Yeast strain soon. And, yes, uh, we'll be using that probably within the week. Uh, we got, yep, uh, we that's got, one of our next batches. I got a bunch of plums sitting at home that uh, I got to get, get picked and brought in for Tim. And uh, I think he is planning on throwing those into our next sour um, with the Philly Sour strain. So um, that's going to be a fun one. I think we're going to do plums. And I think he said some other fruit, too, that he, he was going to get a hold of. So. That's going to be tasty. We need one. Our vaccinium is now gone. I know. We need more. We, we have, everybody's been vaccinated. We're going to uh, sour a uh, lot of the four barrel that we've got going on over there. Oh, so. well, that's good. Um, all right. And then we got – oh, crap. Hang on. In an all-in-one setup like the Mash and Boil or Anvil Foundry, do you advise step mashing up to 150 since they have a six-degree window up and down to get better efficiency? Uh, yeah, it's Never not hurts. a bad idea. Yeah. yeah, Like I said, we like to actually mash in at around 130 for a lot of our beers here and then let it free rise uh, over the course of eight hours. So we actually do overnight mashing a lot, which honestly saves us a lot of time because we mash in, we let it free rise overnight on a relatively low power would be the answer for like the found anvil foundry um but uh we can come back to 160 degree mash and it's gone through all the steps uh we didn't have to like sit and babysit it for the mashing time so we saved ourselves all that mashing time and it works yep. out pretty well yeah totally though um yeah when in doubt mash mash low and raise it up um that's that's probably the most straightforward answer to that question um we got uh somebody's asking about to actually uh here we go. Here, here's a good temp, temp, temp control uh, question from Trite. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, maintaining temperature in the early hours of the morning in UK uh, with a heat pad, a good idea for a fermentation bucket. Um, and I'm guessing your house just cools off um, in the evenings. And uh, yeah, if you've got it on a temp controller, I would say that's not a bad idea. I do know that those heating pads, um, at least like the firm wraps that we carry, can throw off quite a bit of heat. Um, so I would say try to put that on some kind of a controller just because you can end up heating your beer up to 100 degrees pretty quickly, um, which is not always a good thing. Um, unless using Quike. Yeah, unless using Quike. <laughs> um, yeah, and otherwise, I mean, 
wrap it in a blanket. That's probably the easiest thing to do, honestly, if, if you got big temperature swings. Um, as, assuming your fermentation is not super active. If you got an active fermentation, it'll equalize. That's the beauty of five gallon batches. They have a lot of thermal mass, so even if your house cools off at night, um, it shouldn't actually affect the beer too much. Uh, Hayden says Minshew or Breeze. Uh, Minshew every single time. No, it didn't work out well this week, but uh, go Cougs. Um, and then we also got, what is the best and easiest way to get a couple of bottles of beer I plan to keg? Uh, I actually really like to use carb drops, and so when I'm kegging, uh, I'll keg off the majority of it, and during that transfer into the kegs, I'll just pop a couple into some bottles with some carb drops and uh, cap those off and let them uh, naturally carbonate. I like that because then you get to taste the difference between the same beer, forced carbonated and naturally carbonated. Yep. It's so. a good like you know balance. Have we used Lutra on a commercial scale? Yes, we have. We did a video on it. There you go. Um, all right, so we got Tyler is asking about uh, kombucha and uh, whether you can pitch regular yeast with a SCOBY during fermentation. Um, and uh, uh, thought being higher alcohol without prolonging the pH drop. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, that's kind of what's going to happen. So, you, so you're just going to end up fermenting out that tea. We've actually done that kind of unintentionally at our old place. Yeah. Uh, tried to make kombucha, threw a little SCOBY in there, and the next day it fermented just from yeast in the air. Um, but yeah, it is, it is an ideal for around. kombucha because you basically end up with just fermented. Like y you end up tea. with alcoholic tea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got you to gotta realize uh, kombucha, a lot of the bacteria that makes kombucha SCOBY is super, super weak bacteria. Like yeah. it's, uh, I don't know, what's a, I was trying to like, I was going to say like it's but um, so <laughs> it cannot survive an alcohol, which is one of the reasons why it works well with other uh, other bacteria that eat alcohol. So there, that's what what's all going on in uh, kombucha scoby. Um, so it doesn't really work the same way, basically because the scoby is relatively weak. A lot of yeah. the uh, bacteria and stuff that's in the scoby will get out competed yeah. very, very quickly. I mean, with that said, our 4% alcoholic tea was not the worst thing to drink. It was so. pretty tasty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, pumpkin ale in the mash, boil or fermenter, puree, raw or roasted. I always buy pumpkin pie filling and roast that uh, and then put it in the mash. Oh, yeah, because it's getting pumpkin season now. Um, the reason I'd like to put it in the mash, the husks of the grain, the grain uh, matter itself, will actually absorb some of the oils um, from the... Yeah, and it will stick <coughs> up your mash like nothing else. It will, yeah. Tons of rice holes yeah. and uh, Visco Buster. <laughs> um. Any suggestions on a recipe that tastes like a cookie? Thinking biscuit, biscotti slash sugar cookie. Uh, he's thinking 50% Pilsner, 40% Golden Promise, 5% Biscuit, 5% Honey Malt. That sounds in the right range. Yeah, um, I think that's the right direction. Yeah, I've, I've used like melanoidin and stuff to kind of yeah, cover that same say, gap. Yeah, like some of those like aromatic <clears throat> Munichs and uh, yeah, things that are in that sort of range. Um, a little bit of salt. Actually going for a heavy sodium yeah. chloride content in your water chemistry will actually push forward a lot of that. That's true. A surprising amount. Yeah. Yeah, probably no lactose. That'd be the wrong way to go. Um, no, and Hayden rep responded, toast your oats in the oven. That does give a really, really nice, rich flavor and mouthfeel. Yeah. A little, I think you said melanoid too. A little melanoid malt. Yep. A little brew malt, maybe. A little something like that. Yep. Um, all right. Well, I think that was it. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm still catching up. There's a lot. All right. Well, we got we to gotta, we gotta wrap this up, though. We only got a few minutes. Want to taste some milkshake sour? Yes. <laughs> Uh, how to sanitize grapefruits for IPA. Don't worry about it. Wash them off really well and throw them in there. Acids. You got acids working for you. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, your risk of contamination is really low for, for any kind of citrus fruit, as long as the fruit's clean. You know, be reasonable with it. Um, yeah, don't sanitize it in your toilet. I wonder if that, what's, what's the beers that we have? We have a couple of beers that have been sent to us that we haven't, uh, mm -hmm. haven't opened yet. We'll get to them. Um, all right, yeah, but that's uh, that's about it for the day today. If you haven't already, uh, tickle that subscribe button, uh, slap the thumbs up button, um, uh, spank the follow bell. Don't don't spank things. That's weird. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in to Every our Sunday. live stream. Hit that like button, please. People haven't hit it yet. Yeah, there we go. Somebody hit it and. Uh, and thank you so much. We will see you next week. We do this every week at 8.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And, uh, yeah, we always have some fun with it and enjoy the conversation with uh, YouTubers out there. So 
We have somebody waiting to come in right now, so we're going to go ahead and close this guy up. See you next week.